Hello, I am Lux, just your simple pony, not a hippogriff. <laughs> simple pony my tail, Mr. Unicorn. I'm a little bit more dexterous than most ponies. What can I say? It comes in handy when I'm painting things. Well, on the other hoof, I'm Ember. And this is our thoughts on My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, Season 8, Episode 6, Surf and or Turf. I think this was their way of tackling divorce. It was pretty much a textbook example of the booklet that I was given by the courts when my parents got divorced. Thank you for sharing that. Well, it's in the past. I would know because my parents are like in a rock solid relationship for like ever. The thing is that the divorce is kind of the more common side of the coin at this point. Thank you. Who was it? Richard? No, it wasn't Richard. I'm trying to remember the king that actually made divorce possible. I'm pretty, tell sure you. It's, I'm pretty sure it's the one who kept chopping off his wife's heads. That be would be Henry. I'm pretty sure it was him because he wasn't getting a male heir, so he blamed the women. Dude, I hate to uh, burst your bubble, but it was your seed that was the problem. <laughs> well, that makes sense. Divorce beheaded died, divorce beheaded survived. Ah, thank you for that, but. Moving on from the history lesson. <laughs> that is probably highly inaccurate. Don't don't trust us for that. Trust us for our to have opinions about ponies. We have lots of opinions. They're right over there in the corner. So, other than this being a really good allegory for divorce, and I like the way they handled it, except for this wonderful moment that made Amber go, pause it, pause it now. The very blunt thing of Scootaloo calling out, who has a problem? Even if someone has a problem, they're not going to answer that. Yeah, it's kind of like how the most common lie said to most people is usually shows up when someone goes, how is your day going? And you go, fine. Or good, or someone asks how you're doing, you automatically say good or well without thinking about it. Most people don't really want to hear it. They ask as a courtesy, not necessarily because they're interested in hearing the story. You know, what's really interesting is to get some drawing references ahead of time for this, I started watching the leaks. And then watching this, I realized exactly what was missing from parts of the leak. Because I only watched like a couple of clips from it. Just to get an idea of how to draw a Terramar, as you're seeing on screen. The music. How much music there is in every episode. Like every scene has background music. And these leaks, because they were basically stolen, had none of that. Because there were, there were references. They even had the time codes. So the people who were reviewing stuff could go, oh, at time code this, this, and this. We need to fix this. So it wasn't a finished product. And just a brief segue since we're talking about the product itself right now and not the details of the episode. There are some odd commercials in the official app. We got all Groupon today, including the lead speaker in the commercial blatantly flirting with the pool boy. In a scary way. In an episode that's target audience is still primarily considered children, who do not have the ability to use Groupon. Yeah, I think it was primarily for the parents, but these commercials will bring up uncomfortable questions for the parents. So it's like, children's show? The tag that we use occasionally. For kids, right? Yeah! But back to the actual episode. As you can tell, I really like the design of Terramar because, you know, I'm drawing him and all. He's cute. Based on Lux's drawing, I said I needed a plushie. <laughs> I also liked his voice actor. Didn't look at the credits to see who it was, but he has a very pleasant voice. It worked really well for the character. And I liked how he was more of an individual because his sister pretty much felt like a recolor of Queen Novu's daughter. I've also noticed that almost nothing from the movie really came over, like any important characters from the movie. I guess it's because all the important characters from the movies for the movie, I should say, were voiced by stars. You know, really expensive people to hire back. They didn't quite think that all the way through. I mean, having star power voice actors can draw people into a movie who may not otherwise go see it. But when you have such a strong fan base, it's like, was that really necessary? Did they do that for any of the Equestria Girls movies? I don't think they hired any really famous people except for people that I don't think they were planning on bringing back like any villains other than Sunset Shimmer. Because Sunset Shimmer, they just pulled from their already cast of voice actors slash singers. 
because it's kind of funny. Sunset Shipper is basically Twilight Sparkle in another universe without being Twilight Sparkle from another universe. And what's funny about that is the fact that she is the singer for Twilight Sparkle. I've seen some fan comics pointing that out. And the main thing that doesn't seem to have come over is none of the hippogriffs seem to be upset with Twilight. Because it was a big old thing and their queen kind of banished her and then came... To help at the very end, but you'd think she'd still be a little mad because she was going to steal from the kingdom and take away their power. And now we finally have an explanation of why Silverstream was able to transform without the pearl. Because she had a piece of the pearl. Apparently you could break that thing into enough pieces to give every single citizen a piece of the magic that Queen Novu guarded so carefully. But apparently now we could break it into smaller pieces, which probably aren't as powerful. So the next time the next Storm King comes around, you guys are SOL. Unless they do the whole group magical friendship power thingy. Because everyone has this piece, so if everyone gets really close together, also they now can all individually transform, so all of them go But that only works for flight. Though the real question is, like, is it really a piece, or is she just using the pearl to create other smaller pieces that kind of give individuals power? Like, enough to transform Twilight Sparkle, four other, uh, four other creatures into fish. Also, that was a wonderful moment when Scooter was like, wait a minute, this is like flying! I was like, this must be like flying. As soon as Sweetie Belle interrupted Termar, because he was trying to tell them he had a problem and they weren't listening, which bothers me because they're the cutie mark crusaders. They've been helping clients for a long time. They knew that they were sent to Mount Eris to help somebody, which means they should be treating everyone like clients. I'm going to give them a little bit of leeway for the fact that they're still young, even though they've um, been doing this professionally for, I think, at least two seasons now. They're still young. I don't know if they're uh, tweens or teens yet, but they're still young. They're at least tweens. They are still young, but they've taken on this responsibility and handled it quite well in Equestria. Though I think it threw them for a loop a little bit. What do you mean hippogriffs don't have cutie marks? Well, you already know griffins don't. And griffins are a bird-cat hybrid. So why would the bird-horse hybrid have a cutie mark? Except that part of it is horse. And ponies have cutie marks. Now we need to go back and look and see if the representatives from Saddle Arabia had cutie marks because they looked more horse-like than pony-like. Even with my shoddy memory, I don't think they had anything. Or they didn't show their butts. I don't think they showed because they had full um, saddle barding on. But back to this episode, it was pretty obvious that one crusader was going to love Mount Eris, one was going to love Sequestria, and the other one was going to have to try to be the balance between them. I also, speaking of Apple Bloom, <laughs> who was the balance between them, I love how she embellished on the story. You know, because she's a younger sister. She looks, still looks up to Applejack. And I love how she was getting everyone's attention on the train and being drawn into the story until she went, well, maybe I'm exaggerating a little, but it makes for a better story. And then everyone pretty much ignored her. Also that there were still that many ponies on the train when Mount Eris was the last stop. And I did like the fact that we saw some hippogriffs get off the train. Also, dang those hippogriffs. I guess they must have used the pearl or something because that place looks great. That fixer upper, they fixed it up. Big time. It is like fully restored and then some because there's now a land bridge. Yeah. And a train track and everything. They think they forgot to draw something because it looks like the train tracks, like, end. So... How does the train turn around? That or they just back up the train. I hate this part. It's going to be a while. Because there should at least be one of those circles where you get the train into the middle of it and then the track itself rotates and turns the train around. So maybe it had that and we just didn't see it. We won't truly know until the playsets come out. Even then, the playsets don't always match. I was mostly joking, because playsets aren't usually canon, they're, they're usually some type of like mix of canon and whatever we can make look good as a toy. Like our awesome plush of a certain fizzle pop berry twist. Yes, yes, and our, our thanks go out to the uh, brony who gifted it to us. Though it didn't have anything to do with our show. So, other than 
the Scootaloo thing, anything else really drove you crazy? Well, the slight amount of predictability that, okay, one's gonna love one, one's gonna love the other, and then the third one's gonna have to be the balance. And the hippogriff's so insanely enthusiastic, but I can understand being happy about finally taking back your original form. If you saw being a sea pony as being in disguise the entire time, as opposed to a different way of living. If you think about it, so we don't know the ages of hippogriffs and how long they live, what the cycle is. Was everyone who was a sea pony in the movie born a hippogriff? Or were there sea pony births during the amount of time they were in hiding? Hmm. Also, there were, I'm just going to use the word foals, on both sides. So if everyone's choosing between the two, then the infants would have to be representative of those whose parents are fully in one or the other city. Also, it doesn't look like uh, Silverstein and Taramar's parents are actually divorced because they still really like each other. <laughs> they just wanted to live in two different places. But I think it was still their way of handling divorce. Oh, most definitely. I'm saying I don't think by MLP standards it's been the end of a relationship. They're just maintaining separate households. Because they were thrilled to see each other. A lot of divorced parents don't act like that, even in front of their children. Mm. Susan? Bill? Random names. We apologize to any Susans and Bills. Yes. Jane? Doe? I also like the sea pony versions of the Keymark Crusaders. Those were nice designs as well. They were cute. It reminded me a little bit of, which totally doesn't fit because they're ponies, but of the Permaids plushes that we've seen. Ah. I'm not necessarily big on aquatics, but I do have a uh, catfish plush because it was adorable and I couldn't get it off my mind. So I went back to the vendor on the last day and bought it. He actually kept talking about it. It was like the entire time after we saw it. I was like, well, I don't know. I ended up going back to that vendor too and buying some prints, I think. Yeah. It's hard to remember because there's so many great artists that some of these things would go to. Lots of amazing artists. And we still have a stack of cards for people we'd like to commission eventually. Yeah. But moving back to the show. So first song in a couple of episodes. And... It felt a little weak because it basically devolved into an argument between Scootaloo and Sweetie Belle. The phrasing didn't quite work for me near the end. The beginning of it, the phrasing felt more solid and stuff like that. I see what you mean by devolved. Instead of matching the music, they were just going, here's my point, and I'm going to just say it even if it doesn't match the song, but I'm going to do it in a sing-song voice so it's still technically singing. And then we're going to fit in puns because we can. It's MLP. It's kind of part of the show. The porpoise one was nice because... She actually high finned a porpoise. She's like, I totally acknowledge that I did this. Going back to the first visit of them to Sequestria, because Sweetie Belle was already sour against the idea. All she could see was the negative once she went down there. Because she loved the harmonies so much that anything that took her away from that was immediately going to be viewed in a negative light. So she wasn't open to any of the positive possibilities because she had already decided, I like this. Therefore, anything that isn't this, I automatically do not like. And the nice thing about Scootaloo, she didn't have that problem, but she started arguing with Sweetie Belle because Sweetie Belle was being argumentative. Because Sweetie Belle was being so negative and because Scootaloo liked the underwater so much and the freedom of movement that it offered her. It was basically giving her something she really, at least based on what we can tell by the canon of the show, hasn't really experienced. Well, she's been carried in flight. We know Rainbow Dash has done that. But she hasn't been able to fly under her own control outside of the Tantipus dream sequence where she gave herself giant wings. So for someone who's not sure that they will ever be able to fly, to be able to experience that freedom of motion... Which is a really nice experience of like, because both me and you, the moment she started swimming was like, wait a minute. Also, I'm impressed that the permission slip got signed. I thought that they were going to manage to forget that in the course of everything being so busy. Especially with the way they kept presenting the permission slip. It would come up and then someone would go, oh, no, 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 no. Come, come do this. And she'd put it away. 
So I thought, like, by the end of this episode, that thing's not going to be signed. And then Silverstream's going to be upset, and Twilight's going to have failed in her trust as dean of the school. Also, I love how both parents were like, fanboy! Oh my god! I love how it wasn't for the fact that she's Twilight Sparkle, the princess of friendship who saved Equestria on multiple occasions. No, it's, this is my daughter's teacher, isn't she awesome? I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, it is nice to show appreciation to the teaching profession. I appreciated all my teachers. I can't think of a single one I didn't like. I was very lucky. Especially my science teacher. He was freaking awesome. Fun, quick story. There was this one time I had my eyes closed and I was laying my head on the table. This teacher was famous for anyone who fell asleep in this class for taking a ruler and slapping it on the table to wake them up. He comes over. He puts the ruler on the table. I'm sitting there full aware that it was what he's about to do. He slaps it, and I pretend not to stir. Wait a couple of seconds and go, Hello, teacher. Then he goes, Hello, student. I wasn't sleeping. I'm paying full attention. Awesome teacher. I was also a tutor in his class. I was good with science. Yeah, he's great at blowing stuff up. <laughs> so, shall we go over any closing thoughts and then wrap things up for this episode? It was nice that it wasn't just, Okay, help. Charmar decide uh, Twilight from an outside perspective pointing out the obvious why does he have to choose yeah reminds me of this great reaction gift from El Rado where they look at each other go both 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 is good <laughs> so why not both because if the piece of pearl gives them the power to transform back and forth why does anyone ever have to decide beyond managing to keep a household you have your summer home and your winter home I mean, if you can afford it, why not? Also, hopefully that kid doesn't wear it out. Woof! Pew, 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 at the very end. <laughs> back and forth, back and forth, because I don't have to make a choice. Which sounds a bit odd, because that sounds wishy-washy. But it, the point is, you shouldn't have to choose between the people you love. Especially when they both love you. And this has been our thoughts on My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, Season 8. Eight, episode six, surf and or turf. Hi, so we're at the end of the video. Did you like it? And you want to click that button? Are you not subscribed yet? Analytics say most of you are, but just in case. Also, we're at the end of the video. Do you have time? We have other videos. Want to see more of Lux's art while it's not moving? There's links for that. Want to offer some financial support? Lux takes commissions. He also has a Patreon and a coffee. Patreon starts at a dollar, includes monthly sketches with voting rights. Coffee works in increments of three, no recurring commitment, but you do need PayPal. All links in the description. Thank you so much for watching and listening. We appreciate all of the support that we receive in the form of views, likes, comments, dialogues, suggestions, and of course financially as well. But all of it is truly appreciated. Thank you to all of our supporters, subscribers, etc. in whatever form you choose to grace us with your presence.